Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. Glad that you could join us today for lesson number nine. Today we are looking at mission to the powerful. How do we reach people who are in positions of power? An exciting study today. But as we dive in, let's begin with prayer. Father, we're grateful to have another opportunity to learn about ways, practical ways, that we can reach people for you. And as we look at reaching individuals in positions of power, we ask that you will open our hearts and minds to opportunities and help us to find those opportunities that you give us to reach people like that in the world around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad also again this week to have Cliff Shamiradine back. He is the director for the Center for South Asian Religions. And we're grateful to have you back again, Cliff. Welcome. Thank you. All right, so we're looking at mission to the powerful today, people who are in positions of power. Now, many of us maybe are not in positions of power, and we're trying to figure how do we reach these people in positions of power. Does God have a desire? Let's start here. Does God have a desire to reach people who are in positions of power? My assumption is, yes, he does. But what evidence do we have of that in the Bible? This particular lesson is going to challenge us a little because we, we strive on, on in, in a situation where we stay away from people of power because either they are um, government leaders, they are business owners, they run companies, they provide what we need. So we tend to stay away from them because we, you know, they, they're, they're powerful people. And we, they're not in our circle, on the average church member or pastor. So, so how do we even think about that? It's, the Bible is challenging us to go beyond what we are accustomed to. It's easy to work with people who are, we will say, are in need um, in, in a general sense. But when it comes to people who are powerful, ah, th is there any hope for them? Even, does God really even want to save them? <laughs> you know, because they are responsible for a lot of tragedy or a lot of problems we have in society and as well as a lot of good. But the question is, do we have evidence that God wants to reach them? Well, we do. Um, one of the um, famous or known example is in, in the Bible with the little maid, right, and her master. And um, Naaman, as we refer to him in English, right? Um, did God really want to save him or he was just trying to get help? Yeah, but I really believe that God invests um, resources and uses us and calls us to reach the powerful in the same way that he is trying to reach those that are in need. And that little, little maid, as she's sometimes called, she reached an individual who was of, in, in a great position of power, and God was able to use her to, to reach him. Um, it's interesting when you take a look at the story in 2 Kings chapter 5, it says that the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. So this was a servant who was reaching out to, um, to her master's husband. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. So even in this position of, of a lack of power, a lack of influence, God opened a door for this little maid to reach an individual of, of significance, power, and influence. So not even limited to they're out there somewhere and, and I feel insignificant in comparison, but she was actually a servant of, of the one who she reached. I would say even more, she was a slave. Can you imagine slave reaching their master with the gospel? And, and yet God opened the door for that to happen. Uh, clearly she saw an opportunity there she saw a she saw a need there and took advantage of that opportunity to share something with Naaman and it worked out well um, what kind of what kind of a hope or encouragement do you think that ought to give to us oh i said it's tremendous because how much of us are slaves i think we may have slavery still exists today but it comes in different form and we understand that when you look at social scientists, they can tell us all the different ways that we become slaves to, um, you know, to society in so many ways. But just comparison, I think we 
can understand that slavery do exist and people who are in those positions, God is still calling us to, to witness to those who are powerful. And so, but there, there's some other components in this particular story is that her faith was grounded. She knew who she believed in. She even knew the prophet. I mean, she was a little girl. I'm sure she, you know, I don't know, did she ever met him? But she knew about him. She knew what he can do. And so when her master was in need, she can refer to him. She found a channel. She used the channels that was available to her to witness to him. And I think this is also an important step that we can learn as a church. God can use us um, in to witness to the powerful with the channels that is available to the Adventist church. She seemed to be confident in her faith. She wasn't affluent, she wasn't influential, but she was confident and she had a connection with, well, with the most powerful individual in the universe and that's God. Amen. And, and that connection that she had helped her to be able to find an opportunity to witness to someone who was more powerful than she is or was, but not nearly as powerful as her God Amen. is. And, and that's incredible. Now, when we look at those who are in positions of power, the mm -hmm. wealthy, the influential, the, the famous, uh, we may have a, a tendency to kind of look at them as, as if, oh, they're powerful, they're influential, they're wealthy. God must be blessing them. But there are a lot of people who are powerful, influential, and wealthy who don't have relationships with God and, and whose lives are maybe on the outside, they may look like they've got everything, but really lives are falling apart. There's significant holes, things missing, that relationship with God that, that can really ground a person, that can give them purpose, a, a more appropriate purpose. How does that misconception or how could that misconception that the powerful have their act together, they don't need anything, how could that misconception cause us to trip up or miss opportunities to reach out to them? I think um, this is where um, God is calling us to be um, a more diligent in, in searching the scriptures to understand his role in our lives and the ministry he has called us to. And so it's easy for us to, as you have shared, to um, say, well, that person has been blessed. They are, you know, what can I share with them? When, if I go to them, they're going to look at me and use their understanding of life. Well, look at me. I have everything I need. I'm being blessed by God. But look at you. You don't even have... Um, half of the resources I have, and you will come tell me I need help, I need Jesus, I need God, when I have everything I need. Um, that can be difficult, um, no doubt. There is no exception to that. We have numerous stories about us trying to go witness to the, to the powerful. The first thing I wanted to observe here is that the methods we use. We need to use different methods, and we see Jesus did that. Um, one of the things that Jesus did in Scripture um, and we see it with Zacchaeus, we see it with um, powerful people, is that he creates a space for them to hide their, their identity when they're searching him. And so a lot of times when we want to reach the powerful, we want to broadcast it, we want to make it public. But this doesn't work very well with them because of their position of power and influence. Sometimes they're afraid to come to us to express needs because what will happen after? And so Jesus created a space and, and he protected that. He respected their amenity so that they can actually get the help they need and find Jesus and still have a, even to the extent, have a secret relationship with Jesus because of their situation that they're in. You know, speaking of, of Jesus creating a place for them to, to meet, it brings to, to my mind the story of Nicodemus. That's right. He met with Jesus at night. He met with him alone. So there was a, a, a personal one-on-one -on -one connection that Jesus had with Nicodemus, that he had with, uh, with Zacchaeus. I want to, let's go to your house and talk, sort yes. of a thing. And, and Jesus was effective in doing that. And, and as you mentioned, we might be more effective if we were able to connect one-on-one -on -one, um, privately with the wealthy. Um, I, I think that's a very valuable, um, very valuable observation. 
which doesn't mean that we abandon public evangelism by any stretch of the imagination. Jesus engaged in both personal soul winning and public soul winning. That's right. And, uh, and he was effective in both knowing when to use which approach and where and with, uh, with which groups of people, because it's not a, not a cookie cutter approach. You can't do the same thing with everybody in every place. It doesn't work very well. When working with powerful non-Christians to reach them with the gospel, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than reaching others with the gospel. That's right. Talk to us a little bit about that timeline of things. Now, God works in many mysterious and wonderful ways in different ways with different people, but it's not uncommon for it to take a little bit longer with somebody in power. Help us to understand that. I had, let me begin with a story. And so I was doing a training for pastors. And at the end of the session, one of the pastors came to me and says, uh, I need some help. Um, I've been trying for many years of reaching the 1% um, in this particular country. And it's been a challenge, I have to say. I tried all the methods I was taught when I went to study and, and I've been additional training, but none of it is working. These wealthy people are not interested in the gospel. Do you have any suggestions um, that I can consider? And I said, let's think about it this way. Um, they have everything they need. So when they see you coming, they're thinking that you're coming because you need something from them. Right? Because that's in the position of power and wealth. And so how, how about change the paradigm? Instead of actually going to them thinking that you have something that you need to fix in their lives, and we all recognize that they have needs. The facade of wealth does not take away um, the crisis that ensued, whether it's children or marriage or even um, business practice and so forth, they still face their own sets of problems that they hide from the public. Um, let, let's flip the paradigm around and, and invite them to come alongside you and serve those who are in need. It creates a space where they can come without having to feel like you need to give them Bible study the first day they show up. So that by long side, you create that space, partner with them. Ellen White talks about that we should partner with the affluent. And, and, and then that includes non-Christians. And, and, and of course, there's limits how much you can partner, and there's checks and balances you have to do. But at least you can create that space. And by doing that, you understand that they can serve with you. So that's powerful. A paradigm shift, not a huge one, but a significant one, help them to come alongside you to assist in that opening the door. That's powerful, that's, that's a huge takeaway. If you wanna get more gems like that out of your study of God's mission and my mission this quarter, I wanna encourage you to pick up the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath School Adult Bible Study Guide, and that is the book that's called God's Mission, My Mission by Gary Krause. It will give you more practical ways that you can reach out to the wealthy, that you can reach out to the powerful, that you can reach out to those who are needy, that you can reach out to those who are poor, that you can apply in your own life to share your faith more effectively with others. Make sure you pick up that companion book. You can find it at itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop. We're going to be back here in just a moment with more as Cliff and I talk about how to reach those who are in positions of power. We'll be back in just a moment. Of the more than 31,000 verses in the Bible, it's said that this one is the most loved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But who said those words? And to whom did He say them? Don't miss great chapters of the Bible, John chapter 3 where we investigate that nighttime interview between Jesus and an important visitor. Jesus in John chapter three said that we must be born again if we want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And later in John chapter three, the final words recorded in scripture of John the Baptist. Don't miss great chapters of the Bible. John chapter three on It Is Written TV.
You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about studying the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious as well. Well, here's what you do if you want to dig deeper into God's Word. Go to itiswritten.study for the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will take you through the major teachings of the Bible. You'll be blessed, and it's something you'll want to tell others about as well. itiswritten.study. Go further. itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We're here with Cliff Shemiradine, and we're talking about reaching out to the powerful, the mission to the powerful. Cliff, if I want to reach someone who is in a position of power, what is required of me? What do I need to do? What do I need to bring to this? What mentality do I need to have if I want to reach someone who's, who's powerful and I'm not? Let's start there. If I'm not powerful, what, what can I do? It's an unusual question because we, we, we normally don't begin asking those questions. We just say, well, as a church, we need to witness. Well, who should we start with? And we just, we create a, a campaign, whether it's public evangelism, or we may decided that we wanted to do house to house, so forth, that, that's how we do it. You know, we seldom don't begin with the question you start with, well, let's reach powerful people. <laughs> we don't do that, but let's assume that's, a, that's our strategy here. We want to reach powerful people. As a church, we are responsible to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are in need and those who are powerful. As I shared in the previous segment, is that if we go to them in general and say we're here to witness to you in whatever form, we're going to get a cold shoulder. Um, we also shared that and one principle we have um, learned from Ellen White is to, is to engage them, is to um, create a space where they can serve with us. Well, guess what? When that happens, there is, there is also what you call a mutual respect for each other because they also have perception. One of the things that I hear frequently is that there is this perception that people who are uh, ministers are just not honest, are not genuine. They're just after my money or after to get fame or whatever the case may be. There's a lack of trust between the powerful and those that are um, that, than the church. I will use that um, metaphor. There's a lack of trust between the two. And then also, I think the first thing is to be able to show that, that you can trust, we can trust each other. And we see we have, we have a number of modern day examples of that. But I think that's the first thing is to develop trust. How do we develop trust? We have to go to them and, and meet them in, in opportunities that God permits and allows. And when the church is making a difference. So I, I want to give you an example, practical example of how we have done this before. Um, we created a center. We know it as uh, sometimes it referred to as centers of influence, urban centers. When we create these opportunities where we serve people, um, the people of position and power notice that, especially when news are spread. And so uh, I remember there was one newspaper article that was published as, real, or as a result of what we're doing for the needy. Well, the powerful people came. Um, government official minister came, called, they drove up and they came and they said, can we meet with you? We notice that you're making an impact in the society and we want to partner with you. But also, whenever you are sharing about what you do, it creates an awkward situation for us. Please don't publish any more articles about what you're doing in the community unless you talk to us because they feel threatened. Powerful people feel threatened when we are doing things that takes away their share of influence in society. So, so we have to respect each other and learning to set their boundaries. And so I think that is one way we as a church can reach out to powerful people to show that we, we have a powerful God. I think it's huge, very, very practical. Let me ask you this, and it's coming from a slightly different, uh, different angle. How do we as a, as a church, as, as members of a church, how do we avoid the trap that because we have the truth, that that's enough to save us. We're talking here about 
our mission that God has given us to reach different groups of people, the, the poor, the needy, the powerful, the wealthy. But if we're not careful, we can just feel like I've got the truth, I'm good. I don't need to worry so much about sharing it. What's the danger in that? Well, we can use the illustration that the powerful things, because I'm wealthy, everything is going well. I, I don't need anything. I don't need God or I do have God. I don't need to worry about anything. The same thing can happen to us because we are rich in the truth. We can forget our need to depend on Jesus Christ. And I think that's, a, that's the danger that we can find ourselves in. And well, we don't need to share anything because we are saved. We are waiting for Jesus coming. Everything is set. Our family is set. The good job, good education. Everything is going well we can fall in the same trap that the powerful and the rich falls into. And so that's something that we need to, to be careful of, that we don't end up being rich in different things, but still being poor. I think. Well, being rich is not the problem. And I think this is an old discussion we can have. Being rich is not the issue. The issue is how do we seize those things and how do we use them to the glory of God? Very good. I like that. So let me ask you this, as our, our time is slipping away from us as it usually does. If I want to be a part of a ministry in a church that reaches out to the powerful, people in positions of powerful, influential, wealthy, what does that look like? What could, how could we effectively do that? Some practical things that we could do, actionable steps that we could take if there are people in our community who fall into that category and they need the gospel as much as anybody else, where does it begin with us if we want to try to reach them? What does that look like? I would say, as a ch let, let's, let's use a church as an illustration. A church is in the community. A lot of times we don't know the church exists. I've done this before. I was in a particular country. It's better that way. And I, I, when I got to the church and did a wonderful seminar for the church, I went outside of the church and I and I looked around the community and see who lived there. I came back to the church and I said, um, how much of us know the names of the people that lives around this church? No one could answer even uh, at that particular time. So I asked the question, if the church suddenly disappear, would anybody miss the church? And I think that's, that's where we begin, is that pe the rich and the powerful should know that the church exists. And how do we do that? There's, there's, um, there's many ways that we can do that. I shared some of that earlier. But I think we can begin to, sh to tell that the powerful and the rich, we exist, and we can actually partner with you with some of the things that you want to do in this community. The powerful people, some of them do care. And others may not even care, but we help them to care by approaching them, have a good proposal or address a society issue or something that can benefit more than just themselves. And a lot of times they're waiting because they don't know that they can actually make a difference. So you mentioned things that the church can do, programs that they can do that, that people in positions of power can come alongside and, and assist with. That's gonna look different in different locations in different uh, geographic areas and, and different neighborhoods even. So what might a few different ideas be? What would be some, some ministries that the church could provide, depending on whether you're in a more affluent part of town, a less affluent part of town, a more um, well-to-do country, a less well-to-do country? It's gonna, I understand it's gonna look different in different places. Give us a few ideas of what that might look like. Okay. So, like, for example, one of the things that, that I tell people, even before you plan to do something, is to survey the community. N know the needs of the people that you are that, that you're serving or you want to serve. A lot of times we presume we know what the needs of people are. So you begin with a survey, a simple survey of finding out needs. And once you do that, like, for example, we just did one here in the place that I currently reside in, and we have... Um, uh, a group of committed people who are working with the affluent. And, they, and we found out that language is an issue. Um, getting support in that. And we also found out that people are having marriage crisis. 
And so, and so you prepare something to reach people who are powerful. So we may take for granted that they could find counselors and they, and they have the resources to pay for them, but they can't find someone who they can trust, who will actually minister to their needs. So having a survey, and then from the survey, you can either create a um, ministry. Um, a lot of times we think about investment, but I think first we need to look at people first rather than start a building or to create an organization. I think we can work with people first. All right, so start with the people, find out what their needs are, and then provide opportunities for, for the wealthy to come alongside. That's right. Very, very good. If there was somebody who's watching this today who says, okay, I never felt like I was called to reach the wealthy, the powerful, but now I'm sensing that maybe God is, is calling me to get a little outside of my comfort zone and to try something new, try something different, reach a different group of people than, I'm, than I feel comfortable doing. What kind of words of encouragement would you give to someone, maybe some practical steps that you could uh, encourage them to take if they're feeling called to do that? What would you tell them? The first thing that we need to keep in mind is that we can't do this alone. We need, a, we need prayer, we need a, a support family. So find yourself with a group of church members where you can actually pray together and look at the gifts that you have and ask God for guidance. The next step is to be able to look at the community. Who are the powerful people that lives in this community? And then begin working on a, on a, on a strategic plan where you can actually engage them on a mutual and a respectful position. And I think we see that, that that's one of the methods that Jesus have used. Fantastic. Cliff, thank you so much for, for helping open our eyes to opportunities that God has out there for us. And thank you for joining us. And perhaps God has opened your eyes to some opportunities, some perhaps uh, connections that you have or that you could easily make. You never know how God might use you to reach someone that you never expected to be able to reach. We pray that God will continue to bless you as you realize that God's mission is your mission. We get to partner with him, the most powerful and in influential individual in history, to do that very, very important work. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to seeing you again next time when we get together again for Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. <laughs>